Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Monday, March 13th, 2023. I am delighted to be back once again with Professor Julia Greer. Julia, as always, wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. It's almost Pi Day. Oh, that's, yeah, 314. 314 tomorrow. That's so 159. Exciting. Everything should be happening at 159. Julia, first, thank you for showing me the wonderful elementary school kids who are having a blast in the lab over there and all of the future scientists you are you are producing here. Oh, yes. <laughs> from young to the not so young. <laughs> Julia, we're going to pick up from our last discussion the transition point from we talked about you're here as an assistant professor, you're hyper focused, the expectation is you're going to be the recognized leader in this specific area that you specialized in, nanopillars. And at a certain point, you felt the freedom to sort of to branch out, to do things mm -hmm. beyond what you were here to do. So to frame that within the chronology, how do you look at that evolution in your research agenda against the backdrop of achieving tenure? Are those like, the, is that the same story? Are you, are you approaching the tenure decision and you want to be ready after getting tenure to branch out? Do you want to do it before getting tenure because that's part of your tenure package? But how do you how did you think about all of those things in the 2011, 12, 13, that, that rough area there? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'd like to point out first, my area wasn't nanopillars, it was nanoplasticity. Nanoplasticity, Nan I'm nanopillars sorry. Nanopillars is kind of a the, the mechanism for how we got yes, there. Yes, yes. Yeah, it my was apologies. nanoplasticity, yes. yeah, so that it's like an actual field. Right. Um, yeah, no, it's a great question because the, those years prior, just immediately leading into tenure are quite stressful, I think, for everyone. Um, and no matter how prepared you are and no matter how much you've accomplished, it never seems enough right. because, you, of course, you're your worst uh, judge or right. your harshest judge anyway. So I think that the most organic way to tell that you are ready to go up for tenure is when you start getting... A little bit bored with your area right and maybe growing outside of it and maybe maybe expanding it more and so that's kind of what started happening with me that this nanoplasticity understanding the role of defects in these very small nano nanoscale structures especially in crystals with different microstructures it was still interesting and to, even now we're still working on some problems about that but honestly, it started becoming a little more mainstream and a little more routine that was interesting for me. And my rule is that as soon as something becomes mainstream, I've got to get out of it. That it's not interesting anymore. Weren't you also saying that there was the, the, the arms race with the Germans? With the Germans, yes, absolutely. It, there's always an arms race with the Germans. As soon as our group or any other group that's kind of like at the forefront of what they're doing publishes something, the Germans just like come and say like, you work yeah. on this, you work on this, you work on this, where you work, and they just have like lots of people, they just have a lot of human resources to actually do these experiments. Yeah. So you can eat, the only way to beat that sort of massive following would be to always stay a little bit ahead. Yeah. So I had always had this idea that um, these individual nano scale building blocks or nano pillars or any other nano shapes can be put together into these much more intricate three-dimensional architectures, and that will provide an extra layer of organization that's somewhere between the atomic layering and the structure that you're building. So at the atomic level, we generally have atomic planes, right? And we have crystallographic planes, and we have in a crystal, it could be a polycrystal, and so you would have different grains with the atomic planes arranged in a certain way. Or even at the molecular level, there, there's this notion of crystallinity, right? So there's some kind of long-range order. Now, that's an organization that's created by the process that made that material. Well, so now if you take that as its own building block and organize it even further into something else, like into a lattice, into a three-dimensional cubic lattice or an octet lattice or something like that, then each individual beam is now kind of like a nanoscale building block, like a nanopillar. But now it's collective. Now it, he's bigger he's bigger than himself he's now part of a community <laughs> that's all organized in this very intricate way that can be periodic just like the atoms are or it doesn't have to be periodic it could be anything you want and so the degree of control that we would have over that architecture is much much broader than what the atoms are allowed to do because that's entirely driven by physics and thermal treatment etc but we 
figured out a way where we can actually write them. We can write these three-dimensional constructs in a way that we control. And so now you have this combination of the properties that are governed entirely by the atomic scale versus this extra level of organization that's very small. It's still at the nanoscale and at the micron scale, but much bigger than the atomic scale. Um, and then you construct them to be as big as a brick. And so it's basically, it looks like a brick, but it's extremely light. It weighs something like a gram or something like that, right? And sits on your hand, and it's also very mechanically stiff. So that's something we didn't know about pre-tenure, or this is something that I wanted to explore. Because the material itself is more than 99% air, Yeah. right? It's all open space. There are these nanoscale building blocks that each have an individual property. And the big question was, do the properties retain, right? Like, do can we harness these beneficial properties that we discovered only at the nanoscale and proliferate them onto much larger length scales or materials with macroscopic dimensions by utilizing this concept of architecture, by cleverly architecting these very tiny parts into a much more organized network, so to speak, so that we can still retain those properties? So that was the big question. But I have an interesting tenure story, story to tell you. Well, let me let me just or ask you, I? So, I, so I can clarify when you start to get bored or you realize that you're not at the cutting edge, you're at the cutting edge of the field, but the field but has the gotten field much is come to you. Right. Is that the point where you say to yourself, I'm now ready for tenure? Are you, is that a, is that a, is that a dual conversation that you're having? In yeah. other words, it is. Very much so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the scope of that field um, has to be commensurate with the, tenure scope. Right. So because the reason why I say this is because it's very common that a small subfield, uh, not small. So for example, lithium oxygen batteries used to be a very hot thing. And that was a subfield within the overall batteries, lithium ion batteries community. So lithium oxygen was kind of popular for a few years and then it just kind of fell out of favor and it left. So that wouldn't be enough for tenure. So, so if that field, if getting out of that kind of a sub subfield and moving on to other things would probably, the scope would be a little bit limited. So yeah. it would have to be a kind of a, a field that has a real following, yeah. like a field where many people are uncovering these kinds of problems. Like the, if there's a Gordon conference organized on that topic, then you know that's like a real field. So that, yeah, right. So when you start feeling a little bit an antsy yeah. to not be pursuing problems, there's still thousands of problems to be addressed, but when they're no longer like exciting, yeah, and you kind of want to probe things outside. So this whole concept that I just described about nanoarchitect materials is what I wanted to try, but I felt like I couldn't until tenure. And is this where the value of the faculty mentor comes in, where you can sort of share those feelings and and superimpose them upon the tenure timing? Is that useful? No. So this is what I want to tell you the tenure story about. Story. That's not where the mentors are helpful. This is where your division chair should be helpful, uh -huh. right? Because you have, so the way tenure works is you have a tenure committee that is appointed by the division chair, right? That happens when the division chair feels like you're ready. And that is definitely something that's formalized in your first appointment letter, right? So you first hired for three years. Um, with an opportunity to renew as an assistant professor. Then when you renew, it's another three years, I guess, um, and with a clear stipulation that by the end of that third year, uh, up or out, which is about fifth year, actually, so at the end of your second year, in the second period, you would submit your tenure package, right? And you'll be evaluated for tenure, and then you have that one more year left. So I think that's how it's constructed. Funny story, if you happen to have children during that tenure process, um, they grant you a year per child, yeah. up to two kids, so you can't mass produce, um, to add <laughs> to your tenure, yeah. which is actually um, a double-edged sword. So, and this is for men and women, I think. For I, men and women, okay. so paternity leave, so you get, so men and women equally, anyone who has a child, you can adopt a child, genetic kid, like any kind of a child, if you happen to go through, become a parent, yeah. or a reparent, I guess again, yeah. um, during your tenure, they will automatically add a year to it, which means that if you're ready for tenure at your regular time, yeah. you would then have to apply early. Right. Because you don't want any sticks. So the reason why they did this is mandatory. So it's now, uh, um, it's not a choice. It's not an option. They automatically add a year to your assistant professorship so that you are not going to apply at the end of your fifth year. But if you have one kid, it will be at the end of your sixth year. If you have two kids, at the end of your seventh year. 
But say... And what if you have twins? And what if you have quadruplets? Same. Same. Quadruplets doesn't count, so only two of those count. But yes, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter in what sequence you had them, but two, a year per child. Okay. Say, career-wise, you're actually ready to go up for tenure yeah. at your regular time, yeah. which is what you'll... So technically, the mentors like t are telling, are helping you are helping you understand if you're working on the right kinds of problems, if you're doing well, if you're visible enough, et cetera. But they don't have any influence when you about when your tenure should come up, tenure case should come up. So if you feel like intellectually and career-wise you're ready to go up at, the, at your normal, regular time, you have to make a special request to do that, right? And that's tricky because you now have to go up early and then the bar goes up, right? Because it's like, well, anyone who goes up for tenure early, what do they think of themselves, why, like, and would the world think that they're ready and all that, like, it creates a whole big splash of, like, cascading emotions. Um, so I had to go through that process. So it's an interesting thing. It's meant to be, so the adding a year per child for tenure is meant to be, um, because everybody, is meant to be a gesture of, like, we understand that having children has a tremendous impact on your life, and so we want you to not be stressed, but instead it created the opposite stress. Yeah. It created the stress that now people are like, but I want to go up, and I don't want this like temp temporary, like I don't want to be tempor temporary anymore. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that was a little bit unpleasant. So it's kind of backfired. Right. Yeah, because they now made it so that there's no stigma, right? So because some people choose to take it, some people didn't, and then there, the people who didn't were like, haha, like I could do it, why didn't you do it? Yes. So they made it mandatory and so then all of us who didn't utilize that had to go to our division. So I went to my division chair and I asked like, do you think I'm ready? I think I would like to apply for tenure now. Like there are many reasons for why I want to be tenured, but I don't know if I'm ready, you know, and all that stuff. So it created an even more stressful environment. Okay. Yeah. So when you're ready intellectually, it's yeah. when you get a little bit bored with your research. And right. when you're ready administratively, it's whenever your appointment ends. So how do you, intellectually through your students when you came upon this nano architected idea like where, where does it come from is that part of the process of being bored that you're sort of casting about or how do you jump into a, a, a new area how did I come up with that idea yeah so we had a co okay we had a collaboration with um, it was a DARPA program and we had a collaboration with people from HRL and the University of Illinois, I think I don't actually even remember, but HRL was a huge part of it. And they were working on these trusses and I, that look like this that you can see here, but like they're truss, truss yeah. architectures, not small, not micro trusses, just trusses. Like what supports a roof. Yeah, but smaller than that. Right, So of course. mini trusses. Right. And they were working on that and they invited me because they wanted to understand the mechanical properties of materials that they're making them out of a little better and so I was part of the team. And as we were working on that project, I kind of envisioned, oh, this is a trust. Like, we can make it into a tiny thing. And I think one of the team members mentioned, like, oh, maybe you can make a nano trust. And I was like, hey, there's an idea. Maybe I could make a nano trust. And so that's kind of how all. And so I always had the idea that I would like to combine these nano pillars or nanoscale building blocks into something larger. Then there was the micro trusses into nano trusses combination. And then there were. It was just like, it was the confluence of all of these hints being dropped that I really wanted to try. And so I think I put a student in it. In, in fact, I remember who it was. Um, and just said like, why don't we try this? Why don't we try to write something, you know? And then the company who makes the two, so the process that you use to write these is called two-fold nanolithography. And the, the company that makes them is called Nanoscribe. And they were a very young company at that point. It was a spinoff from Karlsruhe. It, it's a German company. So it was a spinoff from a professor, Martin Wegner, um, at KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and then another Martin, whose last name I can't pronounce, um, uh, started Nanoscribe. And then they invited me to come visit KIT, and also in the Nanoscribe, because we were already either using one or some, somehow we were already familiar with two-fold lithography. And it was the best reception ever. I walked in, and they were super nice to me, and they welcomed me, just like royal treatment. And they spelled out, they wrote in 3D, Welcome Julia, using Nanoscribe, and then they made oh. little Statue of Liberties and everything. So it was a very, it was lovely, and I just really, really loved that company, and it was like a, it was just a great, we, that meeting was really great, and I felt so inspired after, and I said, you know, we've got to get one of these. So we bought the second machine in the U.S. with Harry Atwater together. We... It, they're not cheap 
all of no. these things instruments are very expensive. So when we got back, so apparently University of Nebraska had one uh -huh. for some reason, and then there were not no more in the U.S. And so we bought the second one, I believe, um, and that's still here. How much was it? Do you remember? Close to a million. Wow. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah, so that's why I split it with Harry, and th and then now we have our own. So, so that one we split with Harry, and we donated it to the Kavli Nanoscience Institute, and then since then I bought our own. So my whole group, my group uses it all the time. Yeah, it's a great machine. It's a great company, and so that's. We tried it. We used that machine. We love love it. It's like one of our favorites, and um, we tried it, and then we tried to coat it with different things. We tried to coat it with ceramics. We discovered in the process of that, that was a big splash paper for us. It was a science paper that, um, if you, no, it was a nature material, science, science paper. So when you write a three-dimensional architecture, that's like an octet, for example, or an octahedron, and then you coat it with a very thin layer of maybe 10 nanometers or so of alumina, it's aluminum oxide, um, if you coat it with 50, oh, and then etch out the polymer. <coughs> so it ends up being kind of like an Easter chocolate bunny that's all hollow on the inside. Um, so it was like that. So we made one that was 50 nanometers thick, which is very thin already. And then we made one that's 10 nanometers thick, which is five times thinner, right? Well, so the first, so imagine your coffee mug with a severe case of osteoporosis, right? Like it's very brittle. Alumina is very, very brittle. It's um, that white material that furnaces used to be made of. Um, very porous, very brittle. So if you were to try to compress it, it'll just shatter and it'll just crack everywhere, right? And then when you make it even thinner, when the walls are even thinner, it should crash even more readily, right? Like, because now it's even that much more fragile. So we discovered that when we do that and we compress it, it just springs back like a sponge. So that was a huge breakthrough, right? So like to demonstrate that the same material, the only thing that was different is the size reduction. So that provided a lovely, like really wonderful way to tie it all into my previous research, right? Where, so the whole point of nanofillers was that smaller was stronger, right? So anything that's smaller behaves differently, right? So that was kind of, the hypothesis we wanted to probe is can you take all of these nanoscale properties and proliferate them onto these larger scales? And that was our answer right there. Like, sure enough, the mere size reduction in this particular material elicited a diametrically opposite response, right? So that was a big, that was a big finding, and that kind of served as the springboard for everything that came after. It's like, oh, well, does the geometry matter? Do the defects matter? What if we don't coat them? What if we coat it with something else? What if we make it monolithic? And then after that came all this chem, we do so much chemistry now. We used to be a fully nanomechanics lab, and now we're chemo mechanics, and we do in biomechanics, and we do in bio nano, and we do so much additive manufacturing in every realm, starting with chemical synthesis. So it really grew like a flower. Yeah. Julia, a previous point you made, now that we're talking about chem and bio, um, when you got here, the idea is you, you are discouraged from collaborating, especially with senior faculty. Right. The whole point is you want to be able to show that you can do research on your own two feet, right? Right. Once you become senior faculty, young senior faculty, whatever, you know, however you call yourself after tenure, like, do the training wheels come off and that's oh. no longer a consideration? Completely. So how do you how do you operationalize that? Because I'm sure you're chomping at the bit, right? You can't wait to collaborate and talk. Yeah, yes. Um, it really is very much like that. The training wheels come up. Not only do the training wheels come off, but they send you off, and yeah. it's like you go bike wherever you want. Like right. they're they're during tenure before while you're an assistant professor, there's a tremendous support network, and so Caltech itself is very supportive like they nominate you for all the awards they put you forth they you don't have to serve in committees like it's great they really protect you boy once you get tenured it's like you're on your own no more funding no more support like you're <laughs> go off into the distance and you came after the associate position was abolished there was no associate you right. were straight from assistant to full so you have none of the responsibilities with this with assistant and then and all full of the on respons respons yeah so we're like the professor. lowest paid uh, lowest paid full professors i guess <laughs> yeah because there's no more hoops to jump no it's been really great actually so yes in many ways you're off on your own trajectory trying to go somewhere and there's so many budding collaborations I think that by the time you're close to tenure, you already are collaborating with people because you already are in kind of a known entity, which is another sort of hint that you're ready for the next step and you're ready to be tenured is when the collaborations just naturally happen. So for example, collaborations where somebody is a theory colleague, and I, we do mostly experiments, that's not against, that, that wouldn't ruffle anybody's feathers because it's just very, because it's very clear who did what, right? So like, I'm known for the, my experimental work, I'm known for this. 
and we have certainly collaborated even prior to tenure, we had collaborated with computational people, fully computational. That's not dangerous, right? So it's dangerous to collaborate with your former advisor, right? Or it's or with like a much more senior person who in general is just very well known in the field. And so those, I actually, um, uh, we probably have, I feel like I've collaborated with so many people that I feel like it's, I, it will be hard to re re remember all of them. But one thing that I found through this whole process is that I formed so many new unusual and unexpected collaborations and that's the most invigorating thing ever. We've collaborated with chemists, with real doctors, with computational people who do computational chemistry, like Tom Miller. Yeah. You're one of the people yeah. you interviewed. We absolutely we have a paper that's about to come out. We had one come out already uh, before. With Bob Grubbs, with so many people all over the world, not just at Caltech, right. um, in fact. So it just basically, your wings are no longer clipped. Like you right. can really collaborate with whoever you want, whatever project. Now, of course, the downside to that is that you've got to raise money to support that research. And so yeah. that's. That's probably what curtails some of the activities that you otherwise would do, is that if, can you raise sufficient amount of funding to pursue these ideas. But yeah, yeah, no, the, collabor the kinds of collaborations I've had have been extremely rewarding. We've collaborated with physicists and with chemists have been really um, educational for us because we all speak different jargon, different language, and so just coming to terms with what you're calling what um, is has to happen prior, right? Like we have to find this common language. So yeah, it's very, it's like budding. It's like you're this flower. You you can kind of make this analogy to a plant, right? So you start out as a seed, and I guess you do well at like erupting, and then they hire you into a faculty position, and all you're supposed to do is grow. Like no flowers, you just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and then the bud comes up, and that's when you know that you're like ready for tenure. And then pff, and then yeah. once it blooms, it just blooms everywhere. So yeah. that's like tenure and lovely life after. <laughs> now, because collaborations are always a two-way street, sometimes you're going Actually, to them. Actually, more than two. No, but I mean, sometimes you're initiating, you're going to somebody and saying, can we work together? Sometimes someone's coming to you and saying, can we work together? What is the commonality, the people who are coming to you from chemistry and biology and business, is there a unified theme of expertise from you that no matter where they're coming from, they're coming to you because of this generally singular area, or or not, you're actually more adaptable and the thing that they want to collaborate with you might be very different than the thing that another person might want to collaborate with you, if that makes sense. You know, it's actually, they're not mutually exclusive, it's both, yeah. it's all of the above. So we have a core, our, our core expertise for sure is in nanomechanics and nanoarchitecture materials and additive manufacturing. I would like, maybe this is like tooting my own horn, but I'm pretty sure we're a little bit of a household name. Like the Greer Group, people know. People know that this is what we do. So if anyone has an idea to put together a team, a proposal team, where they need something very intricate to be built, it's very likely they will reach out. Just because that's what we're known to be. But having said that, the proposal calls and collaboration opportunities usually have their own agenda. And so for example, we have lots of collaborators in a battery team. And it, for that particular team, it wouldn't be some expertise that we generally have. Like it, was, it wouldn't be for any of those three core expertise areas, but it would be maybe more for they really know how to handle battery materials and they can figure out their basic mechanical properties. So they're a great person to have as a team member because not only do they understand the, like our core expertise is not in electrochemistry and it's not in batteries, yet I have so, we've written so many papers on batteries and I have so many students working on batteries even though it's not our core expertise, that that's kind of like more in the second category, right? So like for any team whose central theme might be an electrochem, something that's unrelated to what we do, it's generally good to have a mechanical properties expert on the team, just as a, yeah. you know, because you need to, ultimately you need to know something about your material. So that would be more for your first option, right? Like where they need a particular expertise and we're known for that and they'll reach out. Versus where they're thinking, like there's a team that's forming and they have this idea if, and they want to try some crazy new meta material or something like that, that they would be like, oh, well, let's reach out to Julia and see like maybe they don't make these materials, but we've seen some images and maybe that's something they can do. So they would reach out even without knowing what they're reaching out for. <laughs> and then we would have this conversation and then, uh, you know, I would tell them like, this is what we can and can't, like this just happened very recently. There's a call for hypersonics. We've never worked on hypersonics before. 
and truth be told, I don't know very much about hypersonics, but boy, they think that they could use our metamaterials, and it's like, all right, let's talk about this. Let me tell you what we can and can't do. So it's that kind of, so basically everybody sees their own agenda, and the reasons for reaching out to somebody might be either for their core expertise or because they think that they could enable something that they need. What did all of this mean for your graduate students and your postdocs? So earlier when your group was so focused and now you're so eclectic, so diverse, what does that mean for, first of all, the size of your group, <coughs> but then also the kinds of graduate students or postdocs that are uh, obviously a good match, that you see you're a great person? Did that, did that archetype of student change once yeah. you broadened out or did it not? Hugely so. It that did. is such a good <coughs> reflection point. It really did, because it, it used to be that the type of students who came all cared about nanomechanics in some way, right? So not only were we in the same community, so we would, their advisors, for example, and I would go to the same conference. Right. And their core expertise would be the same as mine. And when we read papers together, we kind of knew who the people were. Even if they were too young to know who the people are, they had heard of them. Right. It's a small world. You're it's saying. a small world. Yeah. Now, and especially, I mean, especially so now, but after tenure, once we started, like, when, once we took this additive manufacturing by storm, my students go to conferences like ACS. So our flagship conferences are the MRS and the TMS, so Materials Research Society and um, the other materials conference. Um, my students now go to ACS, American Chemical Society. They go to ECS, Electrochemical Society. We go to Gordon Conferences. We go to SPIE, which is an optics, nanophotonics uh, type of conference. We go to such a strange and much broader range of conferences that are that otherwise my students would never be, be present in those. So it's very different because of what their interests are, especially all the biomedical people. Yeah. Um, that's even that's a big learning experience for me. So like once we started doing electrochemistry and my students and I started being invited to these battery workshops, right? Or to the battery Gordon conferences, that was a new learning. Then all these biomedical people came, that was a new learning. Then all these chemists came. And so now we're going to all these um, different conferences. So not only did it change the landscape within my group, but it enriched it. It really enriched it because not everybody was caring about the same kinds of problems and they didn't even, in some ways, it was a little bit frustrating because they didn't know as much mechanics, right? So many people who came to work on other projects, like we have this gas diffusion electrode project, right? We have, we have um, many of my students now are working on these metallo-polyelectrolyte complexes, which are mostly chemistry and some mechanics, but they have... So mechanics almost became tangential. And then I was like, wait, 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 no, we can't have that happen. We can't lose that expertise entirely. So we, it was definitely a little bit of like a panic mode once the pendulum shifted so much more towards these other projects, I needed to get back my nanopillars, right? Because we had literally one person at some point who still remembered the nanopillars, and I was like, no, no, we can't lose the core expertise. That's your roots, you gotta it's go my roots. roots. You can't completely <laughs> let go of the roots. Yeah, exactly. So, so we still, we, we do now. But yeah, it, that, was a big, that, that was a big change. In the way that you insist that the fun is in the, 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 the basic science, the discovery, and the applications do you get all of the satisfaction in being socially useful through your collaborators? In other words, wherever they take it and whatever benefits that these products might have to society, is that where you sort of offload your satisfaction in making things that are relevant? Is that how you think about that? Actually, that's a, yes. Like that, there's, it's so rewarding to see that somebody, like, say we published a paper, and then somebody really read that paper, cited it, maybe took our patent, and then made something out of it. Yep. There's no better reward. I mean, for, for me personally, there's, I have a diff for me personally, there's no better reward than your legacy carrying through. So we've now produced nine professors in the US universities. Like yeah. My students and our professors at Stanford, professors at MIT, at Duke, at Penn, like that is the most rewarding part. So I guess my product is another yeah. faculty member at one of the like really top-notch institutions. But the second level of that kind of a high end pride, pride is when something you did, like some right. basic research that you did, or some concept, or even some technolo like more technologically relevant application actually became something and, and is being used, or like when our patents are being, we have a lot of patents, so when our patents are being licensed, right, or, or we started a little company too, that's not as satisfying at the moment. But yes, like having others, having, actually, I guess this is a little bit, um, 
natural for humans, but being invited to be part of the team is yeah. a really big satisfaction. Yeah. Gives you like this, oh, they like really think of me. They really know. They want me to be a part of their team. That's great. Yeah. So being invited to be part of these like seemingly random teams, <laughs> um, because they thought of me, right? And they thought to invite me. Like that's very rewarding too. Julie, I can't help but ask, but the satisfaction when there's a patent that comes out of the basic research, if that patent goes on to be a hundred gajillion dollar idea, are you a little like disappointed you weren't part of it from the beginning? Just not not in terms of your research motivations, but in terms of like there's real money to be made that you're sort of on the sidelines for. No, but I'm not. We we filed a patent at Caltech. And then they and then the companies license it from us. So you don't even you're not even concerned about that? But we have those pet the royalties would go to us. Right. Us meaning Caltech. No, they share it. Uh-huh. Yeah, yes, to Caltech, but they share it with it. Like we get a pretty substantial we as PIs get research funds. So it's really the best of both worlds, you're it saying. It really is, yes. Yes. Yeah. So when we patent something from Caltech and somebody licenses it, they add money to your account. Yeah. Which is what we want. Obviously there are more potential suitors that come to you than you accept, right? I don't know, actually. So the, Do you have I, a hard time saying no? Is that, is that what you're no, saying? No, I just I don't. OTT deals with them. So we have this... No, no, I mean in general, when people come to you to collaborate, oh, yes, 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 there's yes. certainly more people that want to work with you than there are hours in the day. Well, you're right? so... You flatter me. Yes. I, I, I'm just... I mean, that's just... No, it's true. That's, that's a number the nature of the job. Yeah, right? right, right, right. So what would be some of the commonalities, What's an e without naming names, what's an easy yes for you to say for a collaboration, no matter where they're coming from, and what's an immediate no or a red flag where you say, sorry, I'm not interested? Yeah, I actually um, asked that exact same question I asked my PhD advisor for the invitations, because what started happening after tenure is, it, actually even before, not after tenure, like some at some point, is I started being invited to so many things. Like So like let me preface this question about collaborations with the invitations. I got slammed with invitations to go give invited talks at so many conferences and so many seminars and so many events. Like I went to the World Economic Forum twice. I went to give a TEDx talk, right? Like I went to give these talks at national academies and things like that. And all the seminars and all the conferences, it was just hugely taxing. I mean, if I said yes to every invitation that I got, I'd be traveling every day. You wouldn't be a researcher. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing, I also wouldn't be a parent. Like right. no parent can do that. Like right. I right. can't imagine doing this at all. So my so I called up my PhD advisor and I was like I need I was like boss I need some advice like how do I say no or like which thing same question that you're asking me how do you know when to accept something and when to not and he said a very he gave me a very simple advice that I still follow he says when it's a situation where they need you more than you need them then you say no and if it's a real opportunity then you say yes and uh -huh. that really put it in perspective because there's so many conferences that would love to use the name Julia Greer like yeah. as a figurehead, right? Or it's right. like plenary talk. Like now it's plenary talk delivered by Julia Greer. Then they know people are gonna come. Like they're using me as a tool to recruit like attendance. But it's like I'm not that tool for you. So he when he said that at first I was like, what is he talking about? But that's how I treat collaborations. When it's very clear that they have an and just, like where, where whoever is inviting me to do this is not really interested in our development or in our intellectual contribution, but it's more the they object. need it. Right, right, right. But they need it for whatever, for recognition, for maybe getting funding, for whatever, whatever their motivation is. If I can see through that, yeah, which I usually can, yeah, then I typically say no. Sadly, it's you, you're forced to be cynical. Exactly. And we're forced to kind of start with that. Like you assume that they need you more than you, you know, but if it's a, like, for example, if it's the National Academies, yeah, I mean, like, I right. will definitely say yes, right? Like, or those incredible once in a lifetime opportunities, right? right? Like, for sure, like, or the Cavalry Prize or something like that, like, that I've been invited to and have never gone. Um, that I would say, I also say yes to the distinguished seminars, like if it's a named lecture somewhere. That's something to take. That's a true recognition, right? Because then you know the caliber of the people who are going to be there. First of all, I love um, doing seminars when they're students, right? Because ultimately, that's who that's our legacy, right? That's where the reason to do all this research is so that you can pass it on to the younger people who take it even further. Yeah. So that's why having professor having my students become professors is so extremely rewarding because they take that legacy in a much more interesting direction that I could even think of and they succeed, right? Like, and so it's like that passing on. So distinguished seminars bring in not only great 
faculty members so that I'll collect, connect with colleagues, but also very, very brilliant students. So those, those I typically say yes to, and the red flags are all the like invitations from, shall we say, certain uh, geographical destinations. Yeah. Um, you know, or something like, when it's a conference that no one's heard of before, right? Or like, like to a Gordon conference, I would say yes. Or when it's some, some conference that I'm not familiar with or some something where it's like too good to be true. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. You're not a ratings booster, is exactly. what you're saying. I'm also, I also say no to all the NSF panel reviews. I hate the NSF. They used to be the agency that, the agency that used to fund science. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, they're awful. Speaking of funders, when Kavli and Caltech started talking about maybe doing a, a nano endeavor here, were you part of those early conversations? Were you a point of connection at all? No, it was before me. So that was in 2003. Wait, we're celebrating. Yeah, it was in 2003. We're celebrating 20 years next year, 2024. So 2004 is when they started these conversations. That was before. I was a second year grad student. Okay. So yeah, it was before. But they were building the KNI. So like the entity of the Kavli Science Institute yeah. had already been established. And I came in 2007, and it was just a bare basement. It was... So crazy. It was this sub-basement with exactly two pieces of equipment, maybe three, that had the focused ion beam that I needed so much, um, and the e-beam writer, and just bare walls, like walls and columns, like concrete everywhere. So that's where, that was the clean room um, at that time. So when I first, so I was definitely part of the early building stage, and then there was an interesting development that happened. The Cavalry Foundation had a charter that no untenured faculty member could be on the board. Of directors, so that I didn't know about this, but there was a faculty board of directors, um, and I guess they changed the charter, or they uh, um, modified the charter a little bit for me because they really wanted me to be on the board. So I was included in the board much before I was supposed to, and so I was very much in that decision-making body from probably 2012, 11, or 10, 10, 2010, or something. And now I'm the director of the yeah. Kevin, right? So I had been there from 2010 to. 2023, so for the last 13 years, which is a longer than anyone else, really, other than the founding directors. That really speaks well of Kay and I, that as a board member, you really get to see what's going on. I really And understand. you still wanted to become director. And I director. still have all the people complaining. Like, I understand yeah. all the complaints. I didn't want to be a director. I was made director. That was voluntold. That was like a definite uh -huh. uh, situation of nobody asked me. <laughs> and is there an end point? Is this sort of an ongoing responsibility? No, it's every five years. So okay. I'm in the fourth year now. Okay. Yeah. I'm enjoying it, and I think they like me for the most part, so it's definitely, it was the right leadership opportunity for me. And I would be okay to continue, but I don't think, I don't know, I don't think it's healthy for something to be run by the same director for more than five years. Like, I think five years sure. is this healthy amount of time, so we'll have to see what else is out there. Sure. Beyond nano-architected materials, is there another new initiative in your lab that is at that same level as yes. nano-architected materials? Absolutely, yeah. So we're working with these new, very unique class of materials called MPEC, so it's metallopolyelectrolyte complexes. It's fascinating. It's an entirely new way to look at how a material forms. So usually when you 3D print something, there's this concept called cross-linking. So you start with some monomers and a photo initiator, and it's a huge cocktail. There are a bunch of other chemicals and monomers. Most importantly, you need to build these chains, polymer chains, that then become cross-linked. That's what allows you to architect. That's what allows you to 3D print anything, right? So you start with some liquid resin, you shine some light on it, and then you form this pattern and you do it. The reason why that happens is because there's this photo-initiatable chemistry that starts the polymerization process. So you go from, pol from monomers to polymers, and then they're set in their ways, and that's cross-linked. Now, these MPEC materials are very unique because none of the bonds that they form are covalent. That's, so it's like, it's like um, uh, not monogamous. It's like a very open relationship type thing. It's like, oh, I'm going to coordinate with you for now. But then, you know what? Like, if I'm pulled in another direction, I'm just going to dissociate. And look, no strings attached, literally. So these, proper, the, these polymers are self-healing. For, they're remarkable. So you make something, then you cut it, and then you put them back, and all the bonds reform. Because they're like, we never had any permanent bonds to begin with. Now you put us back together, sure, we'll reform. They can, depending on the metal you put into it, aluminum versus um, nickel or zinc or calcium, you can stretch it by 2,000% and get that much. Like, you can make an artificial muscle out of this thing. 
Or if you put a different metal into it, it'll be much stronger or much more stiff, for example, but it won't, ex it won't be as stretchy. You can um, make actuators with them. They're all hydrogel based, so they're like water sol soluble. They can be put in diapers that can absorb a ton of water. So these polymers, by the virtue of their molecular, like very in interesting and unique molecular construct, are able to exhibit properties that we hadn't even thought of before. And so we're, this is our, this was re remarkable. We had this little idea. We started synthesizing it. It kind of worked. Then we had another student come in and start doing the mechanical properties. And she showed that, for example, strain rate, meaning how fast you deform something, really influences how they deform. So if you take this little bilayer strip yeah. and you pull on it really fast, it'll buckle to the right. If you take exactly the same strip and you pull on it very slowly, not pull, push on it very slowly, it'll buckle to the left every time. And there's a reason for it. So different strain rates lead to left versus right buckling response. And then depending on how long you hold on to it, which is called the stress relaxation experiment, it'll curl up by a different amount when you release it. Say you hold it for an hour, it'll curl up a whole bunch. Say you hold it for one minute, it'll curl up a little bit. Or the other way around. So basically all of this chemistry fully translates into mechanics. And this is, and then we recruited some collaborators, so chemical engineering collaborators who helped us, who are still working. <coughs> this is becoming more and more exciting by the day. Now we have the mechanics theory collaborators. This team is now like six people. We're studying its fracture properties and toughness properties. Like for example, usually stiffness and toughness are mutually exclusive. Something is either stiff and strong or tough. We're getting both. We don't understand why, but it's all about these bonds. So yeah, that's so we're very excited about these dynamic bonds and making materials out of them. So you're you're really learning much more science now, in a sense, <laughs> yeah. than you were in graduate school or as an assistant professor. You know, I would say. Well, um, how do you think of that? Th yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I was learning much more deeply in one area, so right. it was like a very deep dive in grad school. In grad school, it was a very deep dive into a relatively new field, but I knew everything about nanoplasticity. I knew my dislocation theory. I knew everything that I needed to know in that one relatively narrow field. Now, my learning is much broader. So yeah. because of that, of course, I can't, I can't go in as much depth. So I still have that core expertise where I really understand the microstructure of metals and metallurgy and defects, and those are the classes that I teach. But all of this new chemistry I learned through these projects, right? So I know a lot more in the, in the sense that I know a much broader set of topics, but um, yeah, but I can't go in as much depth. And is that where your graduate students and postdocs come in? They're your Instrumental. access points? Instrumental. They're my deep divers. Yeah. So I'm basically the boat <laughs> that delivers all the deep divers in. Um, but yeah, I learned a ton from my students and from my postdocs, and they te I wouldn't have been able to do it. I learned so much about batteries because they were working on batteries. You know, I never took electrochemistry. So absolutely, I would not be able to do any, I wouldn't have accomplished any of this without my grad students. How much have you transferred your own graduate experience into the kind of mentor you are? The good parts, I mean. Yeah, I really did. Like, I really think it's super important to show your students that you really believe in them. So we, this is a kind of a touchy subject a little bit because we go on a retreat every year where we hash things out. So that's where I usually pose about three questions for the group of the nature like, what works, what doesn't? If you knew back then when you first started what you know today, what advice would you give to your younger self? You know, or what advice would you give to me? Or what work, what in your opinion, you know, so like very provocative type questions, you know? And then everybody goes up and shares. I, at fr when we first did the retreat, I didn't think anyone was gonna share. Everybody came up. They shared things about such private things. And you know, whatever happens at the retreat stays at the retreat. And I didn't know, it was an experiment. I didn't know if people were gonna be willing to go there, and everybody did. It was, it was very, it was a cathartic experience. Everybody shared, everybody, it was uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, right? Because a, l a lot of these things are not good, right? Or they would say like, I felt lonely, I felt depressed, I feel, especially during COVID, lots of people said that. Yeah. Um, or I feel detached, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, I feel like I'm not doing enough, like I feel like I'm not getting enough feedback, or like all of those things, like all the criticisms come through that, yeah. right? And so my mentorship style is hugely influenced by that, and so I really try to respond to their needs. Some of them are di ridiculous, right? But it's a good reflection point. So I try to be maybe not so much my graduate student experience, that influences it the most, only in the sense of being respected, right? Yeah. So I think the key, 
the key learning that I took from there that I really impart into my students is that I respect is really important and um, believing in them, right? Like showing them like, look, it's okay. Like I'm going to be harsh about your research if you're not doing well. Or like if, you're not, if your results are not great, that's part of the academic training. But we're going to finish this. Like you're going to succeed. Like it's not... Yeah. It's not like a permanent thing, you know, and so that that's kind of a huge thing. And then together with all the feedback from from the retreat, we have office hours every Monday. So today we had them where people just come for one on one attention and they ask anything they want to ask. Right. Yeah. From those discussions. So a previous comment you made, which was very interesting, the cultural divide when you got to Caltech and your fellow cohort of junior professors, the cultural divide of you all wanted a mentor relationship and that generationally nobody knew what you were talking about. You were supposed to be tough and stand on your own. What are, now that you're on the other side of that, on the young side of now senior I'm faculty, mentor, yeah. right, <laughs> what, what sort of generational divides are you now seeing given that you have this relationship with your students where they can share their feelings with you? What are they expressing that you need them to express because you wouldn't see it yourself? Yeah, you have to set expectations very early on and to align on expectations. I feel like what I've learned is that most of conflict, most conflicts, arise from a mismatch of expectations. And I think this is really important for any kind of mentor-mentee relationship is to, to talk about it, to say, like, these are, this is what I expect, this is what you're supposed to do, you know, or this is how you might, these are the different pathways that would help you succeed. And I expect that you are going to follow one of them, right? Or something like that. Or like on the opposite side would be, well, if you're my mentor, I expect to be meeting with you every quarter. Or like I expect this. Or like we, like monthly check-ins or something like that. So I think spelling out and really being open about what you expect from each other is really important for any relationship, but especially for a mentor-mentee because there's a little bit of a power differential. And whenever there's a power differential, it's you know the mentor has to be really careful not to override, like not to overshadow, right, and not to overrule or override and dis be dismissive. And on the mentee side, they have to exhibit their own initiative, right? Like it's on them to ask for help. It's on them to to um, d to, to be a self-initiator, right? Like so if you need something, you have to step up to the plate to recognize that that's what you need and to go ask for it. Julia, what does the best summer look like for you in terms of what you need personally, what you need as a scientist, as a scholar, and what you need as a mentor to students. What does the best summer look like? I love going on mini sabbaticals for the whole summer. I love being in Europe, Norway, or like this year we're going to Cambridge. Uh, a few years back we went to Norway. Um, we went somewhere else, uh, France. We went to France uh, last year. I need, I think that traveling internationally with my kids. Yeah. Yeah, so taking the family and going to a different place to in specifically to a different country so that just to get rejuvenated right so that we're in a different environment we're not in this ridiculous Pasadena heat but also just to clear your mind and I find that I come back a better mentor and a better parent and a better teacher and a better colleague just to cleanse the palate so to not be here so I think that the summers definitely taking definitely making it into somewhat a vacation as well but just to you know, when you're bogged down with so many responsibilities and you're stressed out and you have to raise funding and all this stuff, like you're pulled in so many different directions that it leaves very little room for creativity other than to just roll away. You know, I can think while I roll away. But it's very hard to think when I'm attending to daily needs of every student. I have more than 20 PhD students and postdocs and undergrads. So cleansing the palate by going somewhere internationally and doing a mini sabbatical for even half the summer is the best. Do you think not being born in the United States, having a dual culture, um, how can I say this, that it, it, it gives you a sense of the importance of culture in science, that it's important to see how the Norwegians do it or how the French do it? Is that, are you, are you sensitive to that or is that something that you want to get out of that experience as well? A hundred percent, but actually I'll push it even further. It makes me feel good about being an American because people in other countries, especially in Europe, um, they're bogged down by so much bureaucracy. Like they don't do science the way we do it. Like yeah. we're definitely the freedom country here, yeah. even academically speaking. Yeah. Um, it is. It's very enriching 
to go to Asia as well. Like we spent a sabbatical in China as well. Um, to go to Asia, to go to Europe, to go to countries that have a presence that um, in the scientific world, and to compare contrast, of course, right, and to learn how they do it. But also, it makes me feel really good about where we are because we're so much more in control of what we work on. We're so much more independent. We're so much more self, um, self um, sustained. Self. Uh, we're autonomous. Like at Caltech, each faculty member is responsible for what they're doing. Nobody's telling me what I'm supposed to work on. Nobody, like if I can get funding to work on problem X, I will work on problem X. If I decide I don't want to problem work on problem X, I don't. It gives you this tremendous degree of freedom and control. We're all control freaks, of course, right? So it gives you that sense. But that's not how things are done in Europe, ever, right? There's this always overseeing governing body that you kind of have to always report to someone or something like that. So there, the amount of freedom that you have as a scientist in all those other countries is a lot is curtailed a lot compared to us and so in many ways it's kind of it's it's but at the same time they're really good teammates so european scientists and asian scientists work together much better than we do mm -hmm. like just as a general statement the rugged individualism of the united states that's right the rugged <laughs> individualism <laughs> shows itself in many different ways but one of them is that like they operate as they don't fight. There's no infighting. Yeah. Or there's not at, at least as visible as I can gain in three four weeks. You know. Uh -huh. But something like that. So I see that the camaraderie is actually genuine, and they're all working together. But also because they're all working together, they sort of don't have their own ideas as much, and they kind of all represent the same idea that somebody else maybe have given them or something. Like that. So it's like the collective versus discrete a little bit. So it's very interesting to compare and contrast. Yeah. Yeah. Moving our conversation closer to the present, when COVID hit and everybody had to stay home, what were there automated techniques that you could lean into to keep the lab going at all? Well, so we never shut down. So I came into work every day. I'm considered essential um, in my office, of course. We had the 410 schedule. So we had cohort A, cohort B. Um, that, so, so yes, we have, we have some automated techniques so that you can monitor stuff from home. Of course, we shifted a lot of our efforts towards theory and trying to do right. things you know, computationally. But everybody came in. Uh, we did the 410 schedule. Is in, you come in for four days, um, cohort A comes for four days, and then you take one day off, and then cohort B comes for four days, and you come back, and then they leave, and then so, so it was like that. So the trouble with that was that if you come in on one day, you're not going to come into lab for another 10 days. Right. Right? And so... This is not how science is supposed to happen. Well, people wouldn't take risks. Right. Of course that's not how science is supposed right. to work. Not only that, but they would only do the experiments that they knew for sure would work. And so that cohort of, of um, grad students during that entire COVID period was very um, timid. And they're still kind of timid. And it's hard for them to still integrate socially. Like I even had this year... I had my TA ask me, so are the office hours going to be on Zoom? And I'm like, nope, nothing is going to be on Zoom anymore. They're all going to be in person. You're all supposed to be here, and you have to come to class. But I remember very well teaching here. So I had three computers. I had this computer and my iPad to write things, and I had the camera filming me, so I was all here. So I was physically in the office while the kids were Zooming at school, and my students would come in, you know, would all, of course, be wearing masks, and they would be um, doing experiments very far away from each other. And the same, because I also had to do the K&I the Cavalry, right? Yeah. And luckily, my the infrastructure that I have there, so my technical director did all this. But in the clean room, you can't right. have a certain density of people. If you can't have a certain density of people, it's just sometimes you just couldn't walk, like use an instrument because there'd be somebody else in another one. So it was a nightmare. It was like coming up with all these, and we were constantly asked for a plan. Like, send me your COVID plan. Send me your people density. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay. Julian, what ways has your research group fully recovered from the pandemic, and where are you concerned that? culturally or just ways of doing things remain even if the pandemic is on the way out and what causes you concern in that regard you know i was a lot more concerned last year this year i feel i feel a lot i'll more move over <laughs> yeah, it's, it's coming it's again. coming even though it's daylight savings uh i now i feel like we're completely back 
uh, to normal. That's great. How it's hear. always been. Yeah. Last year I was a lot more concerned because I there were there was quite a bit of depression. Yeah. There was quite a bit of still not fully socially integrating. There was a lot of ambiguity because many conferences were offering the hybrid mode and there would be, or like many events would be like, you can do it in person or you can do it, um, you can either do it in person or you can do it virtually. But then if you do it virtually, you don't get the same benefit. And so it was just confused, right? And so many of my students um, didn't know were they supposed to go to a conference, were they not? What what should, and I was very concerned about some students who like about their mental health, like just making sure that they're okay. So I always check in, like I always, like if I don't see somebody for a couple of days, it's like, hey, just wondering, you didn't show up at the meeting, how's it going, like where have you been? That kind of thing. So I was def I'm definitely still concerned, but less COVID related, but just the well-being of every student. That's one. Um, some of the ways that are set it, that actually set in was really funny when we were still in the midst of COVID and everybody, remember how I said everybody still came to lab, they just didn't come at the same time and we had to keep away. There was a certain pathway that the Greer group was supposed to enter, for, for example, from a different yeah. building and yeah. over the bridge. And then another group goes, you know, the painter groups goes, well, goes the other way. So I still come in in the same way, like I enter in exactly the same way, enter the building through a different building, how it's always been. So there's some patterns that are set. Um, I think we're a little better at managing our time now, but last year people were still, you know, when during COVID, I think that the biggest complaint that, complaint that the students had is that there was no more structure in their day. Yeah. So they didn't have to get up. Like Caltech students are already quite nocturnal. And so there would be no reason for them to go to bed because there was nowhere they had to be. They could just do class on Zoom and it's like from your bed and you just don't turn on the camera. And so they really started becoming very unhealthy, like just yeah. not sleeping enough or sleeping at some random times and not, eating properly and all that stuff like that so that was that was where I really felt like I needed to throw a, um, you know a, a lifeline to each one so we still did the group retreat on zoom we did all that on zoom I still met with that we still had group meetings on zoom but like we did everything in the same like all the same structure was there we just did it all on zoom but then everybody became zoomed out so it wasn't until this academic year that I feel like everyone's recovered and like all the COVID kids are finally fully socially integrated and it's much better. Yeah, last year I was still concerned, but this year, this year I don't even know, like other than that question of like how the office hours gonna be on Zoom. Yeah. Um, I don't even, like nothing is, oh, we don't, great. we no longer even have the testing, nobody has to get tested anymore. Right, yeah, right. So it's much better. Yay, that's really nice. So to nice to hear, right? And like being that. vaccinated is really nice and yeah. We all felt a little bit like we were doing something wrong actually it was really uncomfortable because we had to get to like I don't know like the feeling of being here during COVID like I had my letter that said Julia Greer is essential to the operations of this bit like she's I'm totally allowed to be on campus but like even when I'm was rollerblading in and like and you had to get tested I don't know you just felt like you would be tainted if you got yeah. more positive or something like that like yeah. I don't know that whole culture of like, or that yeah. whole atmosphere on campus was not happy so it was much is happy now 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 I feel a little bit like we're in the overdrive mode honestly yeah. I miss COVID a little bit because it was a lot more calm yeah. in some ways the zoom sucked but the not traveling honestly it right. was great and right. so it taught me to be a lot more selective about my travel yeah actually I really learned I really learned that we can accomplish a lot of things on zoom like yeah. a lot of these meetings that we used to have to go to to the NSF panels, for example, all NSF panels are right. now virtual. Right. You don't have to fly to DC. Um, there, the um, meetings, like team meetings for a DARPA team or something like that, all done virtually, and it's so great because we all know how to use Zoom very well. We know how to use the whiteboard. We know how to share a screen. I've given so many talks virtually, and it's great. Like I've participated in so many panels virtually. All of those, like. Think about the carbon footprint. It really reduces the carbon footprint. It's so just much. the dead time, getting to the airport, getting and, to the hotel. And your own sanity and your family life. Yeah. Like my family, the quality of my family life is so much better because I'm actually there, right? The thing that backfired, the thing that backfired, I think, is that when you don't travel, everybody's used to you being there. The grad students, the postdocs, right. the kids, you're everybody. Too, you're too accessible. So at that point, you become too accessible. And so then you're kind of like, uh, you can learn how to do things on your own like you you know so it's like it's you know it's a double-edged sword in the sense that being always available is like teaching them not to be independent or as independent so yeah so there's a, everybody needs a lot of attention 
Well, Julie, now that we're happily and hopefully in the post-COVID reality, Forever. right into the yeah. present. So just to bring the story right up to today, Oh, are they doing the experiment now? Oh, we should narrate for the audio. Can what what, what are we looking well, at? Well, I here? think they're going to make this ublux. So they're going to make they're going to slide on it. See, they're putting on the booty, uh, the cleaner booties. I guess. So the bigger people in there are my grad students. Uh huh. The smaller er, and undergrads. These two are grad students, and the other two are undergrads. And the smaller people are the elementary school students from Car. And I guess Seneca is explaining to them what they're gonna, yeah they're, they're going to slam. <laughs> they're going to put a lot of porn starch in there and dilute it with. I forget what it is, uh, but it's the it's this um, corn starch wet thing that if you hit it really hard, it feels like concrete, and it's uh -huh. called a non-Newtonian fluid. And then if you slide on it, it'll be very compliant and lovely and slippery. Cool. So that's what he's explaining, I guess. Real life, what a post beautiful post-COVID experience. Experience, right? They, they're all here. so nice. So nice. Yeah, once they start sliding, we'll, I'll invite you to come and watch it because <laughs> I can see it too. So well, anyway, we're in the present. Now we're, we're in the present. I think, first of all, what, what are you currently working on? What's sort of on the agenda these days? Well, I already told you about the MPEX. Yes. Right, so that's one. Yes. But, like, what are some no, of the... No, like, like today. What is like your... I, I always like to ask, just as like a time capsule, March 2023, right? What are your days look like? What are your responsibilities? What's the science? All of those things. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't I tell you about my week? Because that's a that's kind of a good gl glimpse into what sure. our life is like. So every Thursday at noon, we have this big group meeting. And this is where, imagine it's more than 20 people, right? This is where exactly one person gives a dedicated, more detailed, more professional kind of a talk about their one research project. Of course, we start by all the lab news and you know who's doing what, who's conference, abstract got accepted, safety, how are the tools doing, you know, the general lab stuff. And then we'll listen to like a 40 to 45 minute talk that's meant to be either a preparation for a conference or for a defense or for a candidacy or something like that, but it's one project fully, like a seminar almost. So that happens on Thursdays. Every Wednesday afternoon, I have subgroups. So that's by project. So we have the entire afternoon is dedicated to the different subgroups, like people who work on, <laughs> we now separate them by the um, rigid, <laughs> so like rigid materials versus compliant materials. So all people who work on metals and ceramics come for one subgroup, and then all people who work on hydrogels and collagen and uh, biomedical type things and uh, DNA type things all come um, at a, a different time. And then the batteries folks come at a different time. So it's basically the entire afternoon that's dedicated fully, fully to working meetings and projects. So I probably have about six to eight maybe clearly distinct projects going, maybe closer to ten, but something like that. Uh, projects that are going on and so <laughs> the kids, the PhD students, expect me to just know exactly what they're working on at all times, and I have to put on a really good a good act there. But yeah, yeah, so I'm teaching them, I'm like, put everything in context. Like, even though you've presented this before, just say, like, so remember how I'm working on this problem of understanding the cathode properties, you know, etc. So, so that's what happens on Wednesdays. Every Monday afternoon, I spend in office hours, so that's when everybody gets my one-on-one -on -one attention. So whatever problem, whatever description they want, whatever advice they want, whatever, like, it, the types of questions range from what, um, uh, who should I invite to be on my thesis committee, how do I start writing this paper, what do I do about this, I read this paper, you know, I'm planning to get married, when's a good time to do it, like I want to take vacation, you know, like any, or I'm really struggling in grad school, like what should I do? So it's a huge range, and so it's an open calendar, <laughs> and people sign up for a slot, so that way it creates this atmosphere in our group that they can always count on my undivided attention on a Monday. Right, like so if say they didn't get to see me this week but they really want to discuss something, they know for sure that on the following Monday they will get that attention. So so that's where my Mondays go. Tuesdays and Thursdays I teach. Uh, on Wednesday I also meet with my executive director of the Cavalry, that's my Cavalry day. And on Thursday morning I also meet with my technical director of the Cavalry. So my days are nuts because I'm constantly and then in between all this I'm in three different departments. So I have three different faculty meetings each month and all the Cavalry stuff and all the research stuff and then there are conferences and preparing for lectures and writing papers and patents and submitting recommendation letters. It's crazy. It's I'm, I'm so honored that you've managed to No, you, you, uh, <laughs> I am enjoying this very much, but it's very, I ha could have never, it's a, if people think that professors go to their office and think, yeah. it's a myth. I wish, I would right. love to, right. I used to really protect my time, yeah. uh, my mornings. 
I used to be very protective of my morning, so I would come here at whatever time I got here, and until noon I wouldn't meet with anybody. Somehow that's gone now too, yeah. and I think that happened during COVID actually. That's the accessibility thing. And the probably. accessibility. I think that during COVID, our private lives and our professional lives were so right. integrated together right. that we just never unlearned how how to set those boundaries, right? And so I'm finding my I'm working all the time, like I'm. I, I, of course, I'm with my kids, right? Like, I take my son to the baseball games and my daughter's to soccer games and practices and all that stuff. But, like, say I'm there at Taekwondo, but I'm still responding to Slack, right? Like, while well, he's doing this. And so it's a little bit, like, I don't remember being this connected all the time. So, like, some of it is just COVID, right? So, so when it's, like, you're so accessible. Some of it is just having the phones all the time, right? Like, the phones and the watches. That There's almost an expectation of immediate response. And, boy, there's no stronger message than when you don't respond. Yeah. You know, people, it's just like, phew, everything escalates if you just can't respond, right? Like, because they start forming all these, it's amazing how much damage you can do by not doing anything, you know? So, yeah. So, yeah, my daily life is a little bit nuts. It's very, very um, busy and context switching. You know, you'll have time to think. That's when you go emeritus. That's what that's I what have that's time to think at night. So, basically, <laughs> my second shift begins around 10 p.m. So, from 10 p.m. I used to be so productive from... Like, 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. Like, that was my hardcore work time because that's when nobody's usually bugging me. Uh, now I kind of get tired a little bit. <laughs> so now I can't say I can't last until 2 a.m. anymore. But that's when I do most of my writing. That's when I do most of my thinking. A lot of the thinking happens on rollerblades. Um, a lot of ideas. Uh, but, yeah, like, all the random... All the random ad hoc meetings, too. It's like, oh, I really need to talk to you this week. Oh, can you submit this? Can you meet? Can you meet? You know, so basically, I already don't have any time during the day. So... Yeah, so it's it's um, it's a lot. <laughs> well, Julia, I'm I'm a little sad to say I think we're at the end oh. point. We have covered right up to the beat, right up to the to present now day. to the present. Yeah. So I want to ask just to put it all together a few retrospective questions about your career, and then we'll end looking to the future. So a theme ever since you got to college, right, is fearlessness, right? Absolutely, you have yeah. never been. Obviously, in the way you talk, in the way you do research, you've never been encumbered by fear because you are so visible, right, in ways that you embrace and in ways that you might not embrace, but it's just a fact that... It just is, yeah. How can you serve in the most positive way of, of conveying the value of fearlessness? Yeah, that's actually a very difficult thing because obviously I'm not actually fearless, but nobody is. Um, but I, no, not uh, like you're willing to fearless in your willingness to take risks and yeah. not to be burdened by concerns of failure. Right. That's right. So everyone experiences that to a certain extent, right? Like that, their f fear kills creativity. Fear kills everything. Fear makes you be not believe in yourself, right? And I've definitely had my fair share of people not, like people trying to shoot me down and people attacking and throwing rats and everything. So I, here's what I learned. I learned to basically take a step back and to say, what's the worst thing that can happen? Like if I try this, what is gonna happen? Well, so-and-so is gonna yell at me. Okay, that's unpleasant. But that's kind of where it ends. Somebody's gonna get mad, right? What's the worst that can happen if I try this idea and it doesn't work? Okay, we tried an idea and it didn't work. I sort of taught myself how to transcend the present and look at it from a perspective like, okay, so what are the consequences of your doing this? Sometimes the consequences are great and then it's more fearsome, right? And then sometimes the consequences are like, oh, I built this thing up. Like the consequences of not getting tenured are kind of huge, right? But the consequences of going to a conference and presenting something where you know people are going to be like the huge experts in the field are going to be there and maybe you're not an expert. The worst thing that can happen is that you're going to say something stupid. We're all so worked up. We get so worked up about our insecurities, right? Like, so if you say something that's, that people perceive as stupid or if you say something wrong, being wrong is not a crime. It's okay. Like, I am okay with saying something that I'm wrong about and then just to say that, you know what, that actually was a mistake or something like that. Like, I think it's very healthy to teach yourself to do that, like to not get worked up as in like, oh, so-and-so is going to think I'm stupid but like to not worry so much about the perception and much more about the substance because that allows you to actually try new things. I'll ask, it's, it's definitely a philosophical question. I wonder if you've thought about it. So 
your unique experience of making a really big field defining experiment as a graduate student. You achieved recognition in a big way very early on. It's very, very unique, sort of across science. So it's a philosophical question in the sense that there's obviously a large amount of serendipity to that. Who was your professor? What was the timing? You got the instrument. You worked during these times. You had this crazy idea, right? So that's all the like the chance. But the stuff that's there regardless is your intellect, your hard work, your generosity, all of the other things that go into what makes for a great professor and a great scientist, right? Do you ever try to separate those things out in terms of like what you would have achieved or who you would be if you did like a perfectly good thesis defense that was like 99% of thesis defenses where they're good, you show promise, this is very, this is, this is very impressive, but it's not like blow you out of the water. I wonder if you've ever thought about how you might separate who you are innately from this very particular path that you might have been put on as a result of the serendipitous chain of events. That is definitely a philosophical question. <laughs> um, I do think about that actually quite a lot. And, and it's hard not to feel very lucky. Um, having said that, I, I guess one question, one counter question would be if it had been not me, I, I mean, I guess a, a corollary to that would be if it had been not I, but some other person in those circumstances, would they be here? Yeah. Right. So like that would be one right. corollary to that, right? Like, so how much of that was my like nurture versus nature, right? Like how much of it was my perseverance? Because I really did have to do a lot of experiments at 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Um, to get there, right? And not giving up when things weren't working and really getting that experiment done. I think it's the grit. The grit was always there, and I was kind of unassuming um, about these things. I'm grateful. Um, and then the second question, so, so I personally think that for me, if I hadn't stumbled upon that discovery, there's no way I would have been in academia. It's not worth it. So I guess I would say this. Everyone who becomes a professor at Caltech must have had a wow moment or a wow paper or a wow technique or develop, done something that was so unusual and unique that they landed here. Now think about who we all are, right? Like we're all type A's, we all did this, and because of that we create this culture where we care about things with the same level of intensity. And so it's almost like, the pr I was very lucky in grad school, it, it definitely. And all the grit and the perseverance and all this other stuff went in there. But it also is instrumental to my survival here, right? Like So it's almost like, if it had been not I, who also stumbled and say did all these things and they would have ended up here. I don't know if that would have been the right place for them, right? Or if I had done a perfectly good thesis but not like monumental, I would have never gotten here. So I think all of this together sets it up for the trajectory to get here. Um, and yeah, I mean they're they're sep they are separate, but also they're se you can't decouple them from the same person from the same human, right? And yeah, and. I think that's, so there's another question to be asked, was it worth it, right? Like, so having gone through such a, there was a lot of trauma along the way, right? Like, th th yeah. there's a lot of work and a lot of trauma and a lot of things that happened and, and um, that kind of shaped me into who I am today, which is not necessarily to say anything other than this is who I am today. I think it worked out really well. I'm vi like incredibly grateful for the career, but would I want my kids to go through that? I'm not sure. Actually, probably not. <laughs> only if they want to do it. Only if they want to do it. Yeah, I guess that in re looking back at it, I think we each can, especially women, like women in yeah. science, Yeah. it's a different, we really are a different species. It's not nearly as bad as it was in the 50s and the 60s. I just finished listening to this book, Lessons in Chemistry, Yeah. which is incredible, absolutely incredible book. It's not so bad, and I'm so grateful to all these women pioneers who right. made it possible for us to be here and to succeed and to have a family and um, this, but you kind of have to be an incredibly intense person. So like, I think intensity of the human being is what, um, yeah. the, the serendipity is coupled with the intensity. Yeah. I think that the strongest survives really works well here. Yeah, yeah. Well, you read my mind because my next question was about being a woman in science. Obviously, yeah. you don't have a perspective from the from the 50s or even the 
70s or it's 80s. A pretty awful time for women scientists then. But for the amount of time that you have been in science, what really has changed for the better? And where are you really disappointed of how far things really need to go? Yeah. So I am lucky to say that until I was in grad school, I never felt like I didn't feel like a woman in science. I felt like just a sci like just a yeah. regular person. Like I didn't it wasn't a thing. And this is a credit to MIT. A probably. credit to MIT, a huge credit to MIT, for sure. Everybody was the, everybody was treated with the same degree of acceptance. We're all nerds. We're all nerds and we're all like there was no gender or race or anything. It was we're just all nerds here together. Yeah. And it was great. Then I went to Stanford and it was very similar, right? Like there's the group, the boss's group had women and men and everything. I once went to a conference where some boy told me, you're only here because you're a woman. And he was clearly very jealous because we had just published that big Nano Taylor's paper. And I just kind of looked at him and I'm like, what? Like I didn't even take it seriously. You didn't have the tools to process it. I didn't you. even take it as an offense because I didn't realize that's what was happening. Yeah. I was like, really? Okay, whatever. <laughs> it was only when I started competing or like it, it was only when I started playing with the big boys so to speak when I where I saw like there's the old boys club and there's yeah. the old white boys club I remember there were situations where I had to present a case in rooms full of men and I started like I've given so many seminars in my life and I would literally say like what did you do with all your women like I would be looking at an, at an audience with hundreds of people in there and not see any women or like not eat or you know I might be exaggerating but with very few women and I would absolutely say things like that, right? Like I learned how to, yeah, I'm a performer. So every time I give a talk or anything like that, it's a very natural thing for me to interact with my audience. And it's just, it's sad to see that they don't actually have a lot of women, especially overseas. Yeah. Like, especially when I go to places like Israel, like even to Europe and to Asia, like there are just not as many women in the audience. And then especially in China, there weren't that many women professors to begin with. Yeah. So. I guess as a per, in a personal experience because of this like extreme drive and not being driven by fear I had a few discrete incidents where it was very clear that there was some derogatory remark you know or mystery or you are a bad scientist and women shouldn't be in academia anyway and that kind of stuff but generally I've been a pretty respected person um, but I definitely see that like with my students I had a guy student and a woman student went to a conference together and they're working on a similar project and a question came up and when the woman student answered it's like they didn't even hear her and then this the boy the guy student said literally the same thing to answer the question and everybody was like oh okay okay and then she just like came to me she's like why is this happening and I'm like I don't know actually I you know and I kind of I mean I walked her through this whole thing but yeah. that I've encountered a lot to right. others right. right like that it's if and you're that's, not that's allowed, today, that's, if not that's today. Like right. if you're not allowed, visible, you know, kind of a yeah. bright person that you already feel confident. Like at least you can show how you're so confident. Um, you're gonna get trampled as a woman at first, right? And and now, uh, I mean, Caltech is an incredible place, so everybody's respected, and that would never happen here. But at conferences and at meetings and at things like that, you can definitely, especially like government meetings and things like that, you definitely see a little bit of this like still a little bit of the old boys club culture. If you look at all of your students and what they've gone on to achieve as a composite reflection, what gives you the most joy in terms of your mentorship and looking at what they've done and where they are? Well, so this is, this is exactly what I said before, just watching them become professors. Like when Carlos became a professor at MIT and Wendy became a professor at Stanford and Oppen just became a professor at Penn and at Duke and the University of Washington, I mean, it's mind-blowing because now they are organizing all these symposia and conferences and invite me to be the invited speaker, like Weedy, Weedy the guy who just did the woven nano lattices. Um, you know, they, this is my invite, and they invite me to come and give talks and things like that. It's just like once a Greer Group alum, like once a Greer Group member, you're always a Greer Group member and you're an alum, and just like it's the most rewarding thing ever. Is, is it because the feedback mechanism is so strong in, in demonstrating that you're doing something right? Is that, that what I'm doing about? something meaningful. Meaningful. Maybe not so, I don't know if it's so something right, but something that was so meaningful to them that they built an entire career on them and now they're the ones being 
visible in the field and now they're the ones organizing these symposia and they're the ones that are moving that field forward like just to, to be like oh I served as like I made that I built them and now they're taking that and going somewhere even more interesting than you know what we were doing before watching them grow is like the most rewarding thing ever so for me the product the product are these young professors and young and or scientists at Lawrence Livermore National Labs like people who end up doing so such meaningful work in grad school that they move on, that they build their own independent careers out of it like that. It's, there's nothing more rewarding than that. It's amazing. What do we know about the natural world as a result of all the research that you've done? Not what you know, but what humanity now knows about the nano world, materials. architected materials and nanoplasticity. What do we understand now that we didn't when you were first slaving away as a graduate student? Yeah, that you can, I guess the first thing is that you can uncouple properties. I don't think that was known at all. I think we were so used to being slaves to this, for example, coupling between anything mechanical, anything that indicates mechanical resilience and density, right? So it was a dogma that if a material is strong, it must be heavy. Like you are not gonna go build a bridge out of feathers. You're gonna build a bridge out of bricks and out of concrete because they're coupled together. Con in commerce, you're not gonna go build, um, you're not gonna send something into space or up to be airspace, like a, to be in in the um, airborne application that's heavy because it's going to drop, right? We demonstrated for the first time, like we, my entire army, like my whole everybody, is that any two properties can actually be fully decoupled, and you just have to figure out a way to architect them. So that's, there's always a pathway. There's always a pathway. I think that's probably key. Like just to demonstrate, just you can. There's the, the parameter space in the nano world is kind of infinite, right? Because there's so many different materials, so many different nanostructures. The unifying theme is that all of them exhibit the so-called size effect. That's my whole PhD, right? Like the length scale at which it occurs is very different. It's different for polymers, it's different for glasses, it's different for crystals, it's different for material X, but it exists. That's something that wasn't known until I was in grad school because all these properties were size independent. So. There's the nanoscale size effect. And everything, just about everything, can be architected. That's another thing that we didn't know before. And once you combine these building blocks with architecting, you create materials that are entirely artificial. They're called metamaterials. <coughs> Sorry. So their properties are, these materials embody every link scale, from some nanometers to microns to eventually centimeters, et cetera. And so every link scale offers something unique about it. And when you make these hierarchical materials, they are, we don't even know what we can accomplish because that parameter space is even more like it's infinite times infinite times infinite times infinite. But what we know is that they're very, it's, it, we no longer have to be slaves to all these thermal treatment processes. There's this like quintessential material science triangle structure processing properties, performance perhaps. Um, we can break each one of these. So in simply we can take, or rather not break each one of these, but like take the triangle and and um, uh, constrain it to a single unit, but then to go to the world, you know, world, the world's your oyster by going out of that one single element into much, much bigger constructs. And then you can envision like all of these robots that go in your body, right? Like the people just talk about, or like make writing organs directly, right? Or, or using artificial intelligence to really predict exactly what you need to make your pancreas work again if you're a diabetic or something like that. Like all of these concepts are now within reach. Mm. I mean, it'll take some time, but I would like to believe that that's what we showed, that you can, not, you can make things that we could never have made before, like making or like you can actually write an organ <laughs> and have it function. We, we don't know yet how to make it function and what serves what functionality, but it's no longer an impossible task. The proof of concept is there. The proof of concept is there. And there are many, many more challenges that we would face, but it's possible and I think it's just that shift of like the overall paradigm of like how we think of materials from being like limited by these furnaces and this thermal treatment and these resources to no longer needing that and to only make what we need and to being so much more aware of the sustainability of this process right like so that's what this whole additive manufacturing is about that's what we're working on all the time right is how do you create only what you need right and then you don't make as much waste and you don't like and you don't need to use as much material you can actually build a bridge out of feathers as long as your feathers are very strong right and so that those are the kinds of things that I like to think about
Well, that perfectly leads me <laughs> to my last question, All right. looking to the future. So it's obvious what you have done, what your group has done, what all of your collaborations have done. You have built these universes of new fields to explore all of these things that will keep researchers busy for decades to come in all of these areas. I like that's, to think so. That's obvious. But what does that mean for you as an individual, as the group leader? What is the frontier for you that you're not yet focused on, but that the next time you get bored, that's where you're headed? What does that look like? Well, I think by, the def by definition, it's I don't know yet, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, I would like to understand a lot more how to build intelligence into materials at the material level, um, not by doing what people are doing already, which is you provide some Im input and then it responds to a stimulus so that we definitely have sensors and actuators and everything, but that's not done at the material level. What I would love to happen is when you um, uh, need a shirt or something like that, you go to a computer and then you say, okay, I'm going to, I live in Cal Southern California and the temperature range is this, um, but I also often travel to Alaska in, or somewhere cold, right? Can you tell me what material I should use to make that, just that one shirt? And then it spits out the architecture, the material, the, what, or how, it, it gives you a name of a company where you would go and order that. And then you basically have this textile, right? which keeps you warm in Alaska, keeps you cool in California, and you just have to wash it, and that's it. Like it's, you fully, just like we fully customize our coffee drinks, I would love to see the world that's fully customizable at the material level. So that you, so that you don't, so that like women's shoes can be both pretty and comfortable. <laughs> You know, which is what not no, complete. <laughs> that will never happen. You're right. But so that we're we stop being so obsessed with like so that we focus on what's important, right? And so that we can live in the world where we're comfortable, we are healthy, we're taken care of, and where you only make what you need. And that can happen through these through this through building the intelligence into material as they're being ma made. So that would be, that, that, that's kind of an, something I'm toying with like right now. It's like, how do you, like when the part is being printed, how does it know that it's going to be good? Right, like what parameter do you track, right? But imagine we now have, the materials now have a way to control themselves. Like they're being made, and it's like, oh, I'm not going to be a good part, so I'm, you know, I have a defect. Or some, uh, or, or the a different part says, like, I was planning to be a flower, but now I'm going to be a, coffee pot because like the flower is not working out or something like that. Just having that that intelligence built in and get, like at the fundament at the most fundamental level that you can imagine, I think will enable so many more like so many diseases can be cured by doing this right because you can actually communicate with the cells and you can change the cells and you can provide these safe zones, which we can't right now, right? So many airborne applications, like think about we think about this. Imagine you have a, a tiny, tiny material, two-dimensional material, that's up in space, and you can propel it with a laser. You can go explore different galaxies, right? It's all in the material. It's all because you have this super lightweight material that has the optoelectronics built into it that can be propelled with a laser and communicate the data back to us. All of that is possible. Like, all of this exploration and all of these are enabled if you can build materials to do what, to, to make their own decisions. It's and you're going to have fun every every se second of the way. I will. <laughs> Absolutely. If we can get some funding. Julia, thank you so much for spending this time with me. This has been great fun. It's a treasure for Caltech history. I'm thrilled. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you so much. This was really fun for me. Oh,